All right, I can't see any of you. <laughs> How you guys doing? It's going to be a loud one in here today. We need your energy. What's that? Thanks for coming today, guys. I have some special stuff for you guys to check out. All right. Uh, I'm John Murdy. I'm creative director, executive producer of Halloween Horror Nights. I'm Chris Williams. I'm production designer, art director of Halloween Horror Nights. And today what we're going to do is we're going to talk to you about a brand new maze that we announced earlier in the week. It's called Universal Monsters. Are you guys excited about that? Yeah. Monitor down front. No monitor. Uh-huh. All right. I'm going to need your guys' help because I can't see a single thing that's in front of me. Can you guys see the screens? Is there anything on that screen? All right, let's talk about the monsters for a little bit. All right. Okay, I'll tell you what. We're going to do something in theater that's called improvisation. Are you familiar with it? Yeah. All right. Let's start first of all by talking about the brand Universal Monsters. Uh, how many of you guys are Universal Monsters fans? Yeah. All right. Chris? Yes, I'm a huge fan. My history with Universal Monsters actually goes back to when I was a very, very little kid. Uh, I was four years old when my mom made the mistake <laughs> of showing me a movie called Frankenstein, right? So I'm going to tell you the story, and I'm going to stretch it out, waiting for them to get this up on the screen so I can continue the presentation, because we have a lot of visuals that we want to share with you guys today. In fact, I brought a whole lot of stuff. We want to show you all of the character designs. Would you like to see those? Yeah. Uh, we're going to show you some of Chris's set designs. Would you like to see those? Uh, but first, I'm going to tell you a little family history about how I got into the Universal Monsters while well, we got a second. Um, so I was four years old, right? My mom decides to let me watch Frankenstein. Now this is back in the early 1970s. Do you guys, anybody remember in the 1970s when they used to show the Universal Monster movies on television all the time? Yeah. Late um, night, late night stuff. Every town had like a horror host and they'd always dress up kind of kooky. Uh, do you remember the horror host in LA at that time? No, I, I grew up in... Sacrally? Oh, you grew up in Northern California. Sacrally was in the North, uh, East Coast. You might have been East Coast. Yes. Um, but they would always replay the classic horror monster movies and as a kid I was parked down in front of the TV watching Frankenstein and when the movie ended, my mom came into the room, found me on the couch, huddled in a ball, crying my eyes out. And at that time she did what every mother would do in this situation. She thought, oh my god, I've traumatized my son. But that was not the case. I was crying, not because I was afraid of the monsters, but because I felt so damn bad for them. Do you know what I mean? If you go back and watch Frankenstein, what does that character want in the film? What is he constantly searching for? Love. Love. Yeah, a friend. Everywhere through the movie, he's going around going, friend, friend, friend. And what is he greeted with in that movie? Angry men and women with torches and pitchforks trying to kill him. So at a very, very early age, thank you very much. Uh, I became obsessed with the Universal Monsters, and today we're bringing it all home. Today we're going to bring to life, through slides, what Chris and I, the people at Universal Pictures, the people at Dark Universe, have been working on, which is going to be opening just a few weeks from now. Universal Monsters, music by Slash, let's go. Yeah. All right, first of all, let's talk about what we're dealing with. To quote the exorcist, the power of Christ compels you. The power of Christ compels you. The power of Christ compels you. As I was saying, uh, these are the movies that we're dealing with for Universal Monsters. Uh, they run the gamut from some of the first movies ever made in the silent film era up to The Wolfman in 1941. Before we get into the maze, I just wanted to acknowledge, you know, Universal Monsters has a rich, rich legacy. Obviously, there's all the actors that starred in these movies, but there's three people in particular that, to me, are kind of the unsung heroes of Universal Monsters. The man on the screen is Jack Pierce. Who's Jack Pierce? Monster Maker. 
Who's Jack Pierce? Makeup artist, that's right. Jack Pierce did the makeup. You can tell him, Chris. Oh yeah, he did the makeup for Frankenstein's monster, as well as the mummy, uh, as well as other characters. And you know, as a kid, I knew who he was actually. And uh, you know, he was really super as a kid, very inspirational to me, as as well as others in the makeup industry. But he was. Uh, somebody who's very special, a true visionary. And Jack, the kind of makeup Jack did was out of the kit. Meaning everything, there wasn't molds, there wasn't foam latex back in those days. Everything had to be created out of the kit. And he worked on the Universal Monster movies from Frankenstein, Dracula in 1931, all the way up through The Wolfman in 1941. And, you know, what did he do at the very end of his career? Does anybody know? What was the last thing Jack Pierce did? Mr. Ed. Do you know the TV show with the talking horse? That's the last thing Mr. Pierce did before he died. So we wanted to give it up for Jack Pierce, a true monster hero, ever to be forgotten. This man, James Whale. Who's James Whale? Director, that's right. James Whale directed Frankenstein, The Bride of Frankenstein, The Old Dark House, The Invisible Man. He was one of the most influential people on molding and sculpting and creating these movies that we all know and love. Um, a lot of these people had tragic endings. James Whale ended up drowning himself in his own swimming pool in the 1950s. But today, everybody remembers James Whale as the director of Frankenstein, The Bride of Frankenstein. So give it up for James Whale! Yeah. And last but not least, probably the least known of all these guys, Carl Lemley Jr. Does anybody know who that is? Lemley was the founder of Universal. He gave the studio over as far as the running of the production to his 21-year-old son, Carl Jr. And he is the guy who had the idea to make Dracula, Frankenstein. He championed all of those films. Uh, Universal lost the studio, or the Lemleys did, back in the late 1930s. He never made another movie again after he left Universal. 40 years. He actually died on the exact same day as his father. 40 years to the day that his father died, 1979. But from the time he left Universal, he never made another movie again. So give it up for Colin Jr. Without these three guys, these movies would never have been made. Um, after the movies came out, what happened? They came on television, and in the 1960s, there was this explosion in pop culture. It was called Monster Mania, and up on the screen, you can see some of the toys. I don't know if any of you guys remember. Did you have any of these? Yeah, absolutely. Some of the Aurora models as well, absolutely. And, and are they not cool? I mean, it's really cool back then, but, you know, even today, uh, the consumer product stuff, I think, is really cool, too, actually. And, you know, like, the mummy... Sokies. I took baths in the, in the early 1970s with the mummy Soki. I had all of the Aurora monster models when I was a kid until the 4th of July when my brothers blew them all up with M80s. And then years, of, you know, years later I took them an original creature, the Black Lagoon Aurora monster model and said, see this? This is worth a thousand dollars now. You blew it up with fireworks. Um, but this is the world that Chris and I were born into. This is the world we grew up in. There was a monster craze going on at the time and Oh. Now I'm thinking I shouldn't have quoted The Exorcist. There we go. That's me. That's my fourth birthday. I told you guys the story in the beginning about how I saw Frankenstein when I was four years old. What's in the picture? An Aurora monster bottle for the Wolfman right next to me. Um, after, you know, I saw my first monster movie, I couldn't get enough. I had to see all of them. I'm sure you were the same way. Do you remember the first time you saw a Universal Monster movie? Yeah, I do actually. You know, I was like four or five, and at my public library, which was like a really old, old four or five story building, and it had all the creepy books at the top, at the fifth, where it had all the creaking and everything going on. Um, what I would do actually is, my dad had an eight millimeter projector, and I would rent little eight millimeter reels of the classic monsters, and it would be uh, just a mishmash of a bunch of different stuff, but I would rent those from my public library, and on Friday and Saturday nights, I'd have my own little creature feature show at night in our living room. Then how about Halloween? Because when I was a oh, kid, yeah. hold on. Yeah, there we go. That's Halloween. Every single Halloween I had to you know, dress up as one of the Universal Monsters. Uh, the Wolfman, the Mummy with, with tennis shoes. <laughs> and 
shoe socks and uh, Frankenstein. I, I don't know why I'm wearing a red cape in my Wolfman costume. I have no idea what I was going for at that time. Did you make costumes of the monsters? No, I did actually. You know, I was big into makeup like I had talked about. Actually, I had age of eight, I had a Dick Smith monster makeup kit for any of you guys know what that is actually and um, actually I s still have it actually in a box and everything. Um, and, you know that was a big thing for me is just to kind of crawl up into my own imagination much like John and come up within these characters and produce those especially during Halloween time. You know for First grade through fifth grade, I had to make sure that I won the costume contest in elementary school every single year. So, and most of those years were dressed up, honestly, as the classic monsters. Uh, first grade was actually Frank's. Nice. Um, then I discovered you could go to Universal Studios Hollywood and meet the monsters. This is 1972. If you look at me in this picture, I look like a kid that's in love. He's punch drunk. Yeah. And the poor guy playing the Wolfman is like, oh God, please, this kid's been following me around the park all day. Somebody take this kid away. Um, and Universal growing up in the 70s, Frankenstein was more or less the unofficial mascot of the theme park. And he had a son. This is called Frankenstein Jr. Nice. Then things got really weird. These are real pictures that I found in our archive. Nothing says Christmas more than the bird from Beretta, two goats, and Frankenstein's monster. This is how they celebrated Christmas. I remember seeing this as a kid. And then there are those shows that existed at Universal back in the early days. Land of a Thousand Faces, where they took two people from the audience and made them up as the bride of Frankenstein and Frankenstein. Castle Dracula, which for some reason eventually starred the Hulk, as you can see in that advertisement. But both of these shows are shows I remember seeing and loving coming to the park as a young man. And uh, this is an art and craft project I did in 1975 at my parents' house. And you can see all the Universal Monsters are represented. I still have this plate. It's still in my house. I love the mummy. Yeah, and Blackula's in there, too. Oh, awesome. Um, and that led to a lifelong obsession with collecting the Universal Monsters. This is my personal collection in my house. It's called the Monster Room. I have one of the largest collections in the world of Universal Monsters. And actually, the monsters led Chris and I to meet. It's a true story. Chris, you can probably tell real quick. Yeah, I was working actually um, on the Chicken Run experience, believe it or not. Okay, so, but I was working on that with the creative department down in the lower lot studio, and then I also had an office where I would work on Halloween Horror Nights. And this is during the time when we had done it previously, from 1997 to 2001, during those times. So uh, during the slower periods, I would work on other things, like I said, this Chicken One experience. I was down in my other office space, and I kept looking in this individual's office, who had this huge six-foot poster, which is that one there, of Frankenstein's monster, basically. So, I'm like wondering who this guy is, and it was several months before I had met John, actually, and got to know him, and understood how much of a classic monster freak that he is, actually. So. And uh, the classic monsters was actually the first thing that you and I ever worked on. We did yes. a show at Universal, it was called Special Effects Stages. There it is. It doesn't want to show it to you, but there it is. Yeah. Um, and it had a whole set called Creature Factory that was all about the classic monsters. Chris did the art direction for that. I wrote it. And then together we built Universal's House of Horrors. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, look at that. Which was a permanent year-round walkthrough attraction with all of the classic Universal monster movies. And then together we went on to do, of course, Halloween Horror Nights. These are just some of the many, many properties that Chris and I have done over the years. What's missing? The Universal Monsters. So now, after all these years... That was, uh... There we go. Yeah. Here we are today. Universal Monsters is now a reality. It's being built in the park as we speak. And Chris and I are going to take you through our thought process because we approach this with one goal overall, which is to scare the living fill in the blanks out of each and every one of you, but to do it with the Universal Monster characters, right? We were very lucky. We had help along the way. I mentioned our friends at Dark Universe and Universal Pictures, and we had help from an artist named Crash, Crash McCreary. I'm sure you guys know his work. He did 
Jurassic Park, Pirates of the Caribbean, Edward Scissorhands, on and on and on. One of the greatest creature designers in Hollywood, character designers, illustrators. He designed our key art. That's Crash's work. Yeah, we're very fortunate to be able to have him work with us on, a, on these three characters for us, actually. So, let's start, shall we? Yeah. These are the movies we're dealing with. Again, I mentioned at the beginning, it starts with the very beginning, the very first Universal monster movie, 1923, Hunchback of Notre Dame, goes all the way up to The Wolfman, 1941. And one of the first things that we had to decide when we were conceptualizing this maze is where do you begin? And of course, if you're gonna do a Universal monster movie, I think you begin, much like as Frankenstein begins, in a graveyard. So Chris and I always, always do a ton of research whenever we're doing something like this, and our research led us to Highgate Cemetery in London. Yeah, and you know, you can see um, a lot of this in respect to our inspiration that uh, we're looking at doing, actually, and vines around statuary and big, large tombstones as well. One thing that I look at that might be a little bit different, because uh, there's a lot of greenery in here, a lot of what you'll see is more dead foliage, more yellow, more gray, leafless trees, that kind of thing. So really, really enhance that, that look and set a certain tone right off the beginning in our cemetery. So your maze experience is gonna begin in the cemetery, but it's not just any cemetery, it's a cemetery where all the monsters are buried, right? And you, mortals, by your mere profane existence, trespassing into this sanctum of sanctums, you have caused the monsters to rise from their crypt, from their graves, and get you. So game on, right? Yes. Um, but we also wanted to look at some other influences as well. This is Jim Morrison's grave. Yeah. It's outside of Paris. If you ever go to this grave, has anybody ever been there in Paris, Morrison's grave? What's all over it? Graffiti, right? Everywhere the fans of graffiti, Jim, see you on the other side! Everywhere. Uh, we liked that idea, somebody like profaning a cemetery. And then we started doing more research and we found that all over the world, spontaneously, cool. there is street art about the Universal Monsters. These are just two examples that we found in our research. So as you approach this cemetery, it's going to be tagged. It's going to have graffiti, street art on the front, of some of the different Universal Monster characters, and some of the quotes associated with the films. Once you go into the graveyard, you meet your first Universal Monster, and that of course is the king of all Universal Monsters, Frankenstein's monster. Now the way Chris and I approach the characters, because this is an original take on the classic Universal Monsters films, is we wanted to look at the essence. It is about a corpse. Actually, it's about many corpses that Dr. Frankenstein exhumes from the graveyard, stitches the various pieces together, jolts it to life electricity, and then expects everything to just be fine. But it's not. Because the essence of Frankenstein is he is dead. And he has been brought back to life, but brought back to life in a forbidden way. So we tried to distill that down to its essence, and for us it's reanimated corpse. Again, we do our research, so these are just a couple of research images that Chris and I pulled. One of them is Walking Dead, the work of our good friend Greg Nicotero. And the other one is Frankenstein in one of the later Frankenstein movies when he's set on fire. We wanted to combine those two things, so gave it to Chris. And this is our concept art that came out. Yeah, so, hey, this is our original concept for that. You can see on the, uh, the left side is the overall and the costume intent as well. And then on the right side is the more close-up look where we're really trying to push that exposed bone. You can see that with his skull, with the suture still uh, tied into his skull as well, the rust and it. An extreme burn look as well, and really try to give him a more aggressive approach to this. And then I mentioned we had our friend Crash McCreary who was yes. able to help us out. And Crash, as I mentioned, I'll bring it back up again. That's the concept artist that Crash did, and he added some elements that we thought were yeah. super cool, like those exposed teeth. So we gave that, Chris and I, to our creature creator, who is Patrick McGee of McGee Effects. And I'm going to share with you what Patrick's done with the sculpt. We've got like that extreme burn look to it and kind of like this dislocated jaw with the exposed teeth and we're gonna put in there like a, a dead a dead eye you know because like what John was talking about you know he is essentially a zombie um, and 
we're really just trying to pull all of those and accentuate those specific features like the flat top head and the bolts as well. And then we'll take all that, like the bolts and stuff, and rust all that down. After you go through the graveyard, you come to the cemetery, you find an entrance to a crypt, you go inside the crypt, much like they did in Bride of Frankenstein. Um, outside of the crypt, there are statue characters. Oftentimes, Chris and I have done different gags over the years with Horror Nights called Living Statues. This is a variation on the Living Statue where, Chris, you can't even see this one's face. Yeah. Comes to life, comes after you, you go further into the crypt. And this is what I mean when I say Frankenstein at its core is as scary and disturbing as any modern horror film. Do you guys know who this little girl is? Maria, exactly right, little Maria. In the film, Frankenstein is playing that game with Maria by the lake where they're throwing flowers in the river, and they run out of flowers. So what's he do? He picks up Maria, he throws her in the lake, like a child, because he can't understand. She drowns, her father picks him up in, her arm, in his arms, runs through the town, crying. Um, so we thought, for this maze, this is Maria's crypt that we're going into. Frankenstein's gone in there looking for his friend. He's found her. Unfortunately, he's found her grave. He's taken off the lid, and when you come into the scene, he's got Maria, and she's been in there for a while. And she's a decomposed corpse that's rotting away. That's not the only thing in this crypt. There's also all of the corpses that have been buried in here that come to life, multiple characters that come to life. And then somebody else invades the crypt, much like in Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. The Wolfman. Now when you distill the Wolfman down to his core element, really that story is about the beast within. The entire movie, The Wolfman, was written by a man who was Jewish. And the movie came out in 1941, right at the beginning of World War II for the United States of America. Um, the man actually wrote the movie to be a metaphor for what was going on in the world at the time. That's what made these movies so scary when they came out back in the early days, the 30s or 40s, as they were speaking to their times very distinctly. In this case, if you looked around the world in 1941, it seemed like men were truly turning into beasts, and that's why this man wrote the screenplay for The Wolfman, so we wanted to bring that out, but we wanted to show that transformation process as opposed to the full transformation. So, this was our original design, which you and I kind of went back and forth and weren't all that happy with, honestly. That's our original intent. You know, we were trying to get some differences, but still push those uh, really scary elements, like the bearing teeth as well. We're trying to pull up on, you know, the pointed ears, you can see, and really make them really aggressive and really intense. So then I mentioned again, Crash got a hold of this, and he did his magic with it, as you can see, and this is the sculpt for our Wolfman. Yeah, this is through McGee Effects. It's, it's um, sculpted out of uh, oil-based clay that you can see really the fine details within around around his eyes and everything. So they put a lot of time and effort into this. And you can see with the bearing teeth that we really captured that concept look to it. Yeah. And then one of the most labor-intensive parts of this process, of course, is adding all the hair. So all of those hairs have to be yeah. individually hand-punched into every single mask we make. But that's what our Wolfman is going to look like. Once you come out of the crypt, you're facing, which I think if you've been in the park, have you guys been in the park recently and over by Mel's Diner, you see this big turret rising, which I'm sure none of you figured out, right? None of you guys had any clue that we were going to do a universal monster maze, right? You just saw this big castle coming up behind that giant construction wall. Um, we want to take you into Frankenstein's castle, but we want to take it to you much like Bride of Frankenstein, where it's already started to go to hell. Because, like I mentioned, when I was four years old, who did I think the monsters of Frankenstein's were? I thought it was the villagers. I thought it was all the people running around with axes and torches and pitchforks. To me, they were scarier than the monsters. So we wanted to give these guys a role, bring them to life, and make them feel scary as well. Um, yeah. First of all, this is Chris's design. Go ahead. Yeah, so what I do is, I do little teeny, small little rough drawings, little elevations, and I do do them actually in scale. Some stuff are like a little small quarter inch or even eighth inch scale. And then what I do is I give this, my little drawings to uh, my art team. So this elevation was done by Troy Zimmerman, um, which you guys have, might know who that guy is anyway. So 
As we approach our castle, you know, it'll look like it's on fire. And through the windows, we'll have smoke roll out. You can see the fire through the inside. Um, also projection, too. Yeah, as well as up above. You know, the castle's on fire, but the doctor's inside working. And you can tell by the electrical equipment above working and going off. And you'll see that as we approach. So look, we were really also trying to make the castle kind of, in a sense, be its own character. So I think you can kind of see like the face within, kind of like this little bit of a skull kind of face within to try to make that facility really just look like um, like a castle and a face within it. And then that, you have to enter into its mouth inside to go into the experience. Now swarming all around the outside of the castle are these guys, the angry villagers. Um, but if you look back at the original film, they're all dressed in suits. It's like they all got dressed up to go out and attack the monster. They've all got like these three piece suits on and fedoras. Um, of course, we wanted it to be more like the times the movie was made in or the times that the book was written in. Um, so this is our design for the angry nice. villagers. Yeah, we were just really trying to get a rough kind of peasant look, but then really make them extreme on the face. These guys will be wearing prosthetics, and then we've got some really long, crazy beards for them, and really trying to push the age, but make them very scary. You know, you can see that. Um, and then once you go into the castle, it's all on fire, the beams are falling down, you get attacked by Frankenstein again. Frankenstein, in fact, is the character you're going to see the most in this attraction. Um, but then you come into an area where it says vault, and you enter inside, and it's a film vault. It's literally a film vault. It's the place where all of the monster movies are stored. And what the villagers are trying to do is to burn it all down. They're trying to destroy the universal monsters. There's actually a screen set up with an old projector, and on that projector we're going to be projecting the original theatrical trailer for Frankenstein. And then the monster is going to bust through the screen and attack you. And as you go further into the castle, you start going down these hallways. And that's where you meet the next character. That's the Invisible Man. Again, we went to our research on inspiration for what to do for the Invisible Man. And actually, Chris and I looked back on an effect we did for Halloween 2, Hell Comes from the Battlefield. Yeah. Can you describe how we did this? And you can uh, see how we did this. We did this with UV fluorescent lighting, as well as fluorescent painting, where we had those skull pumpkin forms glowing, like you can tell. Then we had those floating without, kind of like, in space, in this black void. And then we had costume characters wearing these masks, and, and they're all in blackout. So that theory is the same theory that we're pushing forward to our Invisible Man look. Yeah. So this is the design for the Invisible yeah. Man, and all the areas that you see have disappeared. That's how we're doing that effect. So you're going to run into him in the castle, and as you're going through the scene, you're going to hear organ music in the distance, as if somebody's playing an organ. Who can that be? Phantom yeah, of the that's Opera. Our, that's our inspiration uh, for the music. So how we approach the castle is to, to find a reason for why all these characters would be located within it. Because all these movies take place in different countries, in different time periods. We looked at all the rooms you would typically have in a castle or a manor house, and then we found a reason for why one of our Universal Monster characters would exist in that room. So obviously for Phantom of the Opera, it's the music room. So this is just some research that we did when we were thinking about what we wanted that to look like. This is Chris's elevation. Yeah, you can describe is, what we're doing with the statues. This is one of the elevations of uh, inside the music room, and it and it shows one big wall essentially. And through those arches are essentially plexi, so we can get some water effects. So we're down within the Phantom, but we're trying to let you and get an idea that we might be within the canals as well. And as well as we're going to do uh, one of these living statue gags. As you see this elevation, we're going to walk parallel to this wall, and you know what we do is one of these things is not like the other in respect to the statues, and maybe some of them will come to life, maybe they won't. You never can tell. You never can tell. Oh. And then we come to the Phantom himself, who's seated behind the organ. For inspiration for the Phantom, you know, obviously there's the original character done by Lon Chaney. Uh, this is also from some of the later sequels. You know, in some iterations of the story, he was burned by acid. That's what caused his face to become disfigured. Um, but when we look back to some of our sequels that we made to Phantom of the Opera, it's kind of 
tame as far as the level of detail of, the, of that scarring and that burn. And so we looked to movies like, you know, the Batman franchise and the Two-Face character, took that as inspiration, gave it to our designers. Whoop. And then that's uh, the intent, our intent. And you can see it's really extreme with that acid burn and uh, that really exposed eye and around Maya's cheeks, all that muscle tissue and sinew. And then we gave it to Patrick McGee. <laughs> Just doesn't want to do it, does it? There it goes. There you go. Um, and that's the sculpt for the Phantom character. So that, this sculpture actually, for some of you that know a little bit in the effects industry, is sculpted by Jordi Uchel. And he sculpted a handful, about eight different sculptures for McGee effects for us for Halloween Horror Night. So, if you know any of his work, I can tell you, you can see that, that I tell you, we're really um, bringing the best for you guys. Then once you go leave the music room, you come into uh, the banquet room where there is the blood feast. And this is where you're going to meet Count Dracula and his brides, okay? Um, just like I mentioned before, we wanted to come up with a reason for why Dracula would be in this castle. So that's why we kind of went with the banquet room. There's a giant feast taking place in this room, except everybody who's been invited to the feast has been drained of all their blood, and the blood has been smeared all over the walls. Um, and also you're looking out the window to the exterior of the castle. We're using projection again, so you're seeing this blood red sky. You're seeing vampire bats flying around. Um, but before you get there... So there's a... Sorry, go back. Okay. There's some drawings on that. You know, we're going to use a lot of blood. And so I tell you, like last Are year... Are we going to use design, a shining level yeah, amount shining of blood? Yeah, shining amount in the elevator. We used, when you guys went through that, that was eight gallons. Eight gallons of blood in there. And so we're going to use the equivalent. If you look on the ground plan around the table, you see that squiggly line. Basically, that's our blood line on the ground. And that's just on You're the literally going to be walking through blood to get through the room. Yes. Um, for the character of Dracula, for the inspiration, um, we thought about him like you would think about a meth addict, honestly. If you think about somebody who has an addiction, like an addiction to meth, they show that addiction on their face, don't they? Right. Dracula and his brides have the same addiction, it just happens to be a different drug of choice. For them, it's blood. They're addicted to blood. So we wanted to show that on their face by making their skin like semi-translucent and showing every single vein that's in the human face through that skin, which will be part of the design of the mask. And how to do that and how we achieve that is doing a, a mask out of silicone, actually. And we've done those lately, and you guys have seen those. And, and by trying to get a translucent skin look, we can get those veins to look as though they're underneath the skin. And then for the design of Dracula, this is what our artist came up with. But again, we had Crash working with us too, so we took that a little bit farther, and that's the skull. Oh, that's the finished product of the skull. There's also Dracula's Brides. There we go. One more. Um, and in the original film in 1931, they're, they're pretty much like these fanatical followers. Um, so that's what we kind of keyed into for these characters. They're the fanatical followers of Dracula. But we wanted to amp up the level of gore. That's why you see the picture of Carrie. So, gave this to our artists. And they would be covered in blood, you know, you would think that, you know. Um, and that's what we did. And, you know, also we attached kind of like their little cape to uh, their hands and try to get them a little bit more you know, bad-ish a little and bit. And this exaggerated with the makeup too, with the ears yeah. and the facial features. In yeah. fact, uh, this and is the sculpt. Oh. Oh. Every time I do one, I get 12. There we go. Yeah. That's the sculpt for one of the vampire brides. Um, and then once you leave that scene, you come to the collection room. You know, if you've ever been in a castle, oftentimes they have a room where they collect everything that they've pillaged from all over the world, suits of armor, oftentimes there's Egyptian artifacts. So we wanted to build a collection room that has sarcophaguses in them, um, but also there's an elevation for Chris that shows the sarcophagus, and then there's a table in there that's like part of an archaeological dig. Yeah, we made a table. One of our prop guys, Luis Rodriguez, made this table. You'll see it when you get in there. It looks really cool. And, you know, most of the time, 
We put a ton of furniture in. You can see that long wall with the sarcophagus and it's kind of bare for a collection room, but to be totally honest with you, nowadays we've got so much cool furniture and cool prop pieces at our warehouse. You know, we just left it bare and then we went and did a shopping trip at our warehouse where we picked out certain specific pieces that would go in here as well as furniture that we can house more of the collection. So this will be like an Easter egg section yeah. of the maze. As you're coming through, you'll try to find the scroll from the mummy and all of the different artifacts that are associated with all the universal monsters. But you'll also see specimen displays of like spiders and insects. And of course that means the character of Renfield. He's also in the room, but for the mummy, what we really wanted to key into is mummification is not a happy thing. It's an incredibly painful way to die. If you know anything about ancient Egypt, all the things they did to you in the process of burying you alive was horrific, and that pain should show on your face. So Chris and I did a lot of research with mummies, as you can see. Um, some of these are, are mummies they found in Mexico. Some of them are the Bog people from Ireland and other parts of Europe. But if you look at their faces, you can see how they die. They look like they're in agony. And we wanted our character to look like that as well. So this is our design for the mummy. Yeah, we took that, that what John's talking about, that, that scream, and took that and made it more aggressive. As though that mummy is really out to get you and it's super aggressive. So you can see it now. We wanted to bear teeth and a big furrowed brow, and no eyes. And this is the sculpt for the yeah. mummy that's being done by McGee Effects right now. I think this is Jordan too. Yeah, and if you really look closely, look at all that leathery work looking around the texture around its cheeks and stuff. This is really, truly an awesome sculpture. And then I mentioned that there's another character in the scene. He's from the movie Dracula. His name is Renfield. Uh, for Renfield, we kind of keyed in on two different things. Victorian madness was the main thing we were looking for. That picture that you see of the guy in the striped shirt, that is what a Victorian mental patient looked like. Um, the other picture you see is the man who laughed, Conrad V. Um, we really liked that crazy, exaggerated smile from that early film. So we combined those two things together to give us our version of Renfield, which looks like this. And you know, Renfield, he doesn't prey on humans like Dracula and his brides do. He eats insects and small rodents. So if you look closely in his hand, he's got a rat that he's literally ripped in half. And he's in the process of devouring all of the blood from the rat. So it's staining his face and it's all over his clothes. So he also has a little bit of a Joker feel to him as well. And this is the sculpted process for Renfield. And we're really getting that bug eye look, that crazy eye. And then we'll go ahead and paint those eyes and then we'll cut a slit above for the performer to see out, much like our Walking Dead mask that you guys have seen in the park. And then we're coming towards the end of the maze at this point, so we're heading towards the lab. And as you're heading towards the lab, um, you're hearing all of the trademark sounds coming from the lab, the sounds of all the electrical gadgets going off, the thunderstorm happening. You still hear the villagers outside trying to burn the place down. Um, you're hearing the classic lines from Frankenstein, it's alive, in the name of God, now I know what it feels like to be God. And. Um, in the research for how we wanted this to look, these are some of the images we pulled. Obviously, uh, the image of the black and white image is the electrical gadgets from the movie Frankenstein. But we noticed in certain parts of the world, they have a really haphazard way of doing electricity. I think this is from either Bangladesh or India. But this is like a telephone pole outside somebody's house. And you can see where the wires are just strung everywhere. And we thought in the early days of electricity, they wouldn't be that neat. There should be wires that are just going everywhere in Dr. Frankenstein's lab because it is the birth of electricity. So, this is just one wall elevation, also getting those trademark windows, Chris. Yeah, just taking a little peek of that, and it is the trademark windows, you know, it's kind of uh, that German impressionistic style for those times in the 30s that we pulled all those a little bit of angles and such, and created those windows very similar uh, to what you see in uh, Bright Frankenstein as well. And, you know, vacuum form walls, you guys know how we do... Uh, all of our scenic work and everything, true 8x8 eight eight beams and those kind of things. So we're really pulling off those scenic tricks within, you know, this, this whole maze, the whole attraction, actually. And then we run into Dr. Frankenstein's assistant, which the inspiration, in addition to Igor, 
uh, and Fritz, who was the hunchback character from the original Frankenstein, we pulled in the Baron uh, from Doom as an inspiration because really the core of this character is physical deformity. So we wanted to see that not only in his hunchback, his broken neck, but also that his face should be just repellent and grotesque. So we gave him all these crazy boils. Whoop. It's like trying to get it to stop on a dime. There we go. That's the artist rendering, and then this is the sculpt. Yep. There we go. Awesome. Great expression. Really great. Uh, and he tries to stop you before you get into the lab proper. But once you step inside the lab, that means you're going to meet from Frankenstein, Dr. Frankenstein. The inspiration we took for that, of course, was Colin Clive, but also the way they dressed. You know, and if you're a grave digger back in those times, it was a messy job. You were going to get gore all over you, you were going to get mud and dirt all over you, and we wanted to show that as well. And we also just liked the bug-eye expression of Brad Dorff from Lord of the Rings. So we took all of those things, melded them together, and there we go. And that's our artistic rendering for Dr. Frankenstein. That's going to be a face character, so we're casting that to type. And then for the bride. Oh. Damn it. Truly is possessed. There we go. The inspiration we took for this is kind of the Black Dahlia scene that we did for American Horror Story and also some of the dismembered gags we've done for Texas Chainsaw Massacre. We wanted you, when you walked into the lab, we wanted you to see Dr. Frankenstein in the process of trying to assemble the bride before the crazy villagers with torches burned the whole place down. So we're doing a magic illusion gag and you can probably explain, Chris, how this works. Whoop. You guys have seen this uh, similar gag before, which we, we just showed a couple production photos. But you can see here from a cutaway section view where our performer's located, and her upper half is uh, located on the top part of the table. And this is. Uh, yeah. And then the lower half of the body is concealed underneath the table. So basically, the performer, you're using her body from her mid torso up to her head and her arms, but then everything else is a magic illusion effect. And then. At the top of the lab, on top of a slab, right next to the big electrical gadgets and the big switch, is Frankenstein's monster. He's got his hand on the switch when you come in. He looks at you, he says, we belong dead. He throws the switch, and you're all blown to hell. Nice. Da -da -da. nice. And it's a happy ending. But it's not over. Because we noticed where you exit this maze, and this maze, I should mention, is being built in Parisian Courtyard in Universal Plaza on the top deck of the theme park. Where you exit it, that takes you into a street in the park called French Street. And we thought to ourselves, well, wait a minute. We've got two Universal Monster characters whose stories take place in France. Who are they? Hunchback of Notre Dame and the Phantom of the Opera. So taking a nod from the, masquer uh, the Monster Masquerade or the Masquerade Ball from Phantom of the Opera, we decided that we would do a Monster Masquerade Scare Zone that is attached to this maze that you'll experience when you leave the maze. Yeah. And it continues. This is a lineup of some of the characters in that Scare Zone. I'll take you through a couple of them. Uh, the Hunchback of Notre Dame, this is our design of the Hunchback of Notre Dame. He's going to be one of the featured characters in the Scare Zone, kind of like the King of Fools festival that took place in the movie. And that's the sculpt. No, oh, we're so close. There we go. Oh, that's the sculpt for Hunchback. And then the masquerade characters themselves are all going to be iterations of the monsters, but done stylistically. So there's an Egyptian character, there's a vampire character, there's a wolf character, a Frankenstein's monster character, and they're all attending this dance of the dead, this masquerade ball. And then proceeding over the whole thing is the Mask of the Red Death version of the Phantom of the Opera, except he is a still walker about 8 feet, 8, yeah, 9 eight feet, feet tall, tall, and he's going to be presiding over the whole thing, and that's the Universal Monsters maze. And you know what? You guys have been so patient and so cool that I I need to pay you back because you guys had to sit there through all these interruptions and all these distractions and and I want to make it up to you. Is that cool? Can I make it up to you? Hey, that's a good makeup. We have a friend. His name is Slash. And we'd like to invite Slash and Stacy Quinalti, who worked on the music for Universal Monsters, to join us up on stage. Gentlemen, if you would be so kind. No freaking way! Ladies and gentlemen, Slash. Sick with it. 
Right on. So Slash, let's go back in time for a second. Um, we all met in 2013 when you came to Halloween Horror Nights, right? right? Right. And what did you come to see that you wanted to see more than anything? Well, you know what it was? I just came for the whole thing. I kept hearing how great Halloween Horror Nights was. So I finally came down there and then you and I met and we went to the Black Sabbath maze. And the, the thing I remember the most is put these on. It was the 3D, 3D glasses. glasses yeah. and I was like, what the fuck do I need 3D glasses for? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but we went in there and um, I, I, he saw how I reacted. It was the coolest fucking thing I'd ever seen. That Black Sabbath maze was amazing. Can I quote you at the end when we came out? Do you remember what you said? It was the first time I'd ever made audible sounds of elation. I think. I was I was actually going. I, I can't I can't repeat it now. <laughs> but you came out and you're like, we can can we do this together? Can yeah. we do something together? Like literally right after we came out of the maze. So uh, I put my head together with Chris and went, I said, hey, Slash came to the event. He really dug it. He wants to do something with us. So we came up with an original idea that we did in 2013. It was called Clowns 3D. Yeah. It was an original story that Chris and I put together, and then. We brought Slash together with Stacy Quinalti, who will introduce over here. Stacy's our music producer that works for us at Universal Studios, and he produces all kinds of music for the park and original music as well. And so I put Stacy and, and Slash together, and you guys created the score for Clowns. Right. Well, so basically, um, inspired by the idea of doing the clowns, I wrote some theme music, and I, I introduced that to uh, Stacy here, and Stacy did the sound design, and it just came out pretty awesome. Yeah. yeah, this guy's brilliant. And there's a couple pictures. There's Slash and Side Clowns. With those crazy glasses. And he even had a cameo. I don't know if you guys picked this up in, in Clowns, but there was that crazy clown car at the end, and it like came at you out of the dark. And if you looked carefully, there was, there was a clown version of Slash in the clown car. <laughs> but this time... Um, there we go. Oh, no, no, no. Don't. Oh, God. You know, I'm going to leave it here, guys, because I'm so paranoid that if I touch this damn thing, it's going to tell you the trivia question, and then I'm going to have to take this behind-the-scenes tour and front-of-line passes that I was going to give you and rip it to freaking shreds. Okay, so I'm not going to touch the clicker anymore for the rest of this presentation. I'm just going to park it up there and, and talk to you about the maze we're doing right now, which is Universal Monsters. So as soon as I found out we were going to do this, I picked up the phone and I called this man. He called me up and he goes, we're doing a, you know, a, 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 a Universal Monsters maze with all the original Universal Monsters. Would you like to do the music? And I was like, yeah, definitely. So uh, I got to work on working out a, uh, a cool sort of theme for the entire thing. And I hooked up with Stacy here and, and uh, started working together like we did the last time. But this one, this time was a lot more extensive. I got a guitar synthesizer. I started doing all kinds of orchestrations for different instruments doing this basic idea and all different kind of uh, musical tones and, and uh, because of the different periods, you know, and the different kinds of monster themes, having different versions of this same melody with different feels and different instrumentation. And then I work tightly here with Stacy to sort of give it the sound design and do this kick-ass stuff that he does. And it came out really awesome. Yeah, totally awesome. Uh, really, really excited. So, so it's amazing to have Slash part of our attraction again. Slash and I worked together years ago in Clowns. It was really, really fun. And to be able to get together and do this again at that level and, and the depth we did, uh, it was really amazing. So, first of all, how about for John and Chris, a big round of applause for their amazing inspiration. And, and that takes us to, go ahead, John. Well, I have a question. Do you guys want to hear some music? Yeah! Would you guys be, would, we haven't played this for anybody, seriously, I mean, literally just us and a couple of people have heard any of these tracks. And when I was originally, when I, when I started hearing the tracks as these guys were sending them to me, what I was so impressed with is, number one, the scope and variety of the music. You know, Clowns was essentially one track, really, just arranged different ways as we went through the different scenes. If I'm not mistaken, there's 19 different tracks to this maze, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So we wanted to take a different approach this year, which was 
instead of letting one song route through the whole attraction and then everything be uh, effects and scares beyond that, we really got together, Slash and I and John and Chris, and said, hey, let's really try to score this thing so it's really specific to each room, uh, which is a challenge for us, very time consuming, but really fun. So it allowed us to go through each room and each space and uh, devise how, how they would sound and what we thought they would be. And Slash came out with these great melodies and then we turned them into tunes. Yep. So uh, go ahead. Do, do you have a do you have a favorite, by the way, of all the all the tracks that you've written for this space? Oh, um, well, the Matt Lee. I mean, I, I was listening to him in the kitchen before I, he sent him, sent him over to me. And uh, the, yeah, I mean, there's they're all really cool. And I hate to say one's better than the other, but the Masquerade is pretty cool. The dubstep thing is pretty yeah. wild. But uh, the collections room. I mean, you know, there's just a bunch of different. It's cool because it like does all these different genres of music. So it's not just one type of music. It's it really depended on what we were going for in the scene. Dracula. So, Dracula, yeah. Dracula is very different. Phantom is almost, dare I say, operatic. Is it, did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah, guys? <laughs> yeah exactly. I mean, I think there's a, there's quite a bit of, of themes in there where we have, there's industrial areas, industrial zones, There's we have the cinematic, operatic themes, we have more of the uh, melodic old school and very, very uh, theme to the character like Dracula and the collection room. And we also just did some stuff for fun, which is like, hey, let's do a dubstep version and do something really kind of cool, which we ended up loving, and you'll hear that as one of the main intros. I have to say that the dubstep sound I, I asked you to do because you did that thing for, um, you know, the, the walk-in Universal Monsters Maze, and you had the standalone one for a long time. Yeah, how and support. There was that incredible music that yeah, was in there. Yeah, for Monsters Remix. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I wanted to revisit that. Yeah, so that was fun. That was really fun. cool. Well, do you guys want to play a track? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we can. Yeah. Yeah. So here's like the first track we started on, and then kind of became the main theme is behind some of the marketing things that you will see. And I'll roll it. And turn it up. Crank it up. It's rock and roll. Featuring Slash, everybody.
so I have to ask a question, like, um, thank you. that's cool. Hey, give it up for him, man. He's the guy. Yeah. Um, so inspiration-wise, like on the songwriting side, um, obviously I sent you, you know, what I wrote, and I sent you the designs that Chris did, but is anything else enter into it when you're trying to decide what to do for a certain scene, like the one we just heard? Um, basically, I mean, like for the, okay, so this opening theme was just to establish a melody that really fit the whole thing. And then every, for every sort of character or different, different room, just sort of, and that would fit the vibe of going into that room, really being absorbed in that environment. And, uh, you know, the ideas that you gave me were inspiration enough to be able to do all that. And also, because I'm such a huge fan of all the horror movies, you yeah, know, yeah. the Universal Monsters, so it was easy to go there. You guys gotta understand, too, like, you know, we all talk about how Chris, you know, and I grew up as big Universal Monster fans. The minute, you know, like, you get to know Slash and you walk into his studio, it's a big, huge Bride of Frankenstein print. The first thing you see when you walk inside, I think your screensaver is this Frankenstein. Yeah, it's Frankenstein with, with Maria. Yeah, yeah. exactly, with Maria, yeah. So we're, you know, we all grew up roughly around the same time. We're all huge fans of this property and this amazing brand and its legacy. Um, how about, uh, Stacy? like, uh, pick another song that maybe is like, different or uh, departure from what we just heard. Yeah, like, El El so what we did do is we divided some things up by, today I just have some categories so you can kind of get a feel of what we did and how it varies throughout the attraction, uh, which is something really unique to us at ha Halloween Horror Nights and something we found really fun. I think Slash and I uh, building these things and the great ideas that he had. So this is a sample of some of the industrial zones that you'll get through, some of the transition rooms, uh, some of the entrances right here. some of the industrial stuff, and this is, thank you. Yeah. Uh, this is like your cinematic? Yeah, just go yeah, to that one. So this is another, uh, sorry, we just turned Scarole into a listening party. Is that cool with you guys? Yeah. All right, just check it. Yeah, you guys are definitely the first ones to hear this. You stuff, literally so. are. Nobody's heard this. Uh, yeah, no My one. boss hasn't heard this. Yeah, exactly. The, uh, so this is more of our cinematic and type of operatic stuff we use because uh, Phantom of the Opera and other elements like that, we thought it'd be really fun to take a different twist and a different approach. Bunch of samples there. So let me ask a question from you to you guys. Like, obviously, I'm hearing violin there. I'm hearing a woman singing. Is that your guitar through the synthesizer? Yeah. Okay. Well, because I, I play guitar, obviously, but I wanted to. I heard. I heard you play guitar. And yeah, I, I found a piece of equipment that I could do all the different instruments that I wanted via the guitar. Although I did play some piano on some stuff. That's really cool. I play piano like I type, so I'll do. <laughs> Yeah, so Slash would do a lot of things with the MIDI guitar, which was really awesome. It was different for us this time, so we were able to take it and reassign it and re reconstruct new and really interesting things, uh, which was fantastic. We also decided to use the guitar as more effects within the attraction. So instead of just constantly having spider sound effects if we had spiders or some kind of crazy other sound, we wanted to use the guitar to do some really unique things. And here's a little sample of that.
lot of guitar there. <laughs> I've been transformed. <laughs> transformed. You'll recognize these when you walk through the maze. Um, and then one other thing we really wanted to do that Slash came up with some brilliant, brilliant ideas was taking some old school twist onto the new themes. And so if it's Dracula, we really wanted to take this Dracula approach, which Slash just came up with some oh, awesome uh, nice. counterparts to work with that. And the same thing for the collection room, where we wanted to add a little bit of Egyptian flair, and this is where we came up with it. Here's those two samples. You really see the variation, the variety of music styles. So it's not just um, one particular thing that we, that we ended up going with it. Really made it a lot of fun. Uh, and we also have these other couple tracks I love to play. It used to be so, yeah. Do you guys want to hear more? Yeah! All right. You guys take what you've heard so far. Here we go. Let's we can crank this up. Uh, this is the very walkout at the end of the maze.
pretty good. I think you can make a career in this. I want to look into it. Yeah, where are you hear solos like that? Come on, it's Slash. Give it up. You know, it's easy for me because I'm a big fan of Slash. So it was really easy to be able to, to get this and, and, and really honored to be able to get this far with it. And then, um, you know, we have the, the French Street track, the Masquerade. Yeah, so that's, uh, so what you just heard, just to let you know, you know, put, set it with the maze. Uh, after Frankenstein blows you all to hell, and that's why you're hearing that sample of that line in that track. Because as you leave, that's what you're listening to is the track that we just played. And of course, if you know our, our mazes, you know, there's always the final scare and then what follows it? The final, final scare. And then there's the final, final, final scare. And then there's the final, 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 final scare. And then when you're finally done with the whole damn thing and you've gotten to French Street and you take a deep breath, you know, we watch you guys every year. Chris and I stand at the exit of mazes and we watch what you do. And I've noticed over the years you do this. You get out of a maze and you go, <sighs> and that's when you're most vulnerable. And that's when we're going to prey on you because that's what we do. Um, so we decided that we weren't just happy ending the maze where we were ending it. We decided to carry it on all down French Street with another scare zone that's tied to the maze called Masqu Monsters Masquerade. And this is the music for that. Here we go.
shooting this thing right now, and I wanted to thank you guys so much for putting up with you know all our fits and starts and beginning and stopping and beginning and stopping. Um, thank you for being patient. We truly, truly appreciate it. I hope we made it up to you by having our little listening party today, which, like I said, you guys are the first people who've heard all of this. Um, do you have any closing comments before I give away some tickets? Uh, <laughs> I need to put you on the spot. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm just, I'm really excited about it, and this has been a blast to be able to work with this, this team right here. It's amazing. And uh, and I, I love all of your heart eyes. It's one of the best things around, and so it's, it's, yeah, just cool to be part of it. Yeah. All right. Now, again, I'm afraid to touch that, because I'm going to blow this. Um, but we do have this certificate here. I'm going to read it to you. Congratulations, it says. You are invited to experience Halloween Horror Nights at Universal Studios Hollywood with two complimentary Universal Express tickets. And in case you don't know, that is the new name of Front of Line Express. So two Front of Line tickets, including the event admission, which is good because we shouldn't just give you Front of Line tickets without event admission. That would suck. Um, and exclusive behind the scenes maze tour, which will probably be this maze. How's that sound? Anybody want to win that? So I have devised an evil, evil, evil trivia question. So evil that none of you will know it, and I'm going to have to rip that thing into shreds, and that'll be it, and everybody will go home empty-handed. Unless you guys are monster fans. Are you guys Universal Monster fans? Do you know your Universal Monster history? Yeah? Okay. Here's how this is going to work. I'm so afraid to touch this after today. I just want to smash it into a million pieces, live on stage. Mic drop, out. Um, I'm going to tell you the question, and then I'll show you the pretty picture at the end so I don't blow it. A famous actor, very, very famous actor, you might even say he's an actor-director, got his start at Universal Studios as a contract player, which meant that he worked for Universal and was assigned various roles, doing little bit parts, sometimes getting a credit, sometimes not getting a credit. In the case of this movie, he did not receive a screen credit, but he appeared in a famous sequel to a classic Universal monster movie. And I will accept the name of the movie or the name of the sequel that he was actually in. I'll take either one, but I'm gonna tell you what his role was, and then I wanna see a show of hands, and if you yell it out, I will smash this monitor, I will smash this clicker, I will be like Samson and tear this whole goddamn place down to the ground, okay? So hands up, and we'll call out one of you, and then you tell me the answer, and if you win, you win the tickets and the behind the scenes tour. The role he played was lab technician in a Universal Monster movie, and you, sir, stand up and come over here so I can hear you. I saw your hand go up first. Lab technician in a Universal Monster movie. What is the name of the the actor? We're looking for the actor. Oh, oh, okay. All right, right back there in the hat, the baseball hat. Stand up. Who is the actor that appeared as the lab technician? In a Universal Classic Monster movie, there you go, he's going to give it to you. Do you know it? Revenge of the Creature, please. You are absolutely right, and I love you so much because that proves you are a classic Universal Monster fan. So you're going to be joining us for front of line tickets to Universal Studios Hollywood, Halloween Horror Nights 2018, and a behind-the-scenes maze tour of this very maze that we showed. Is that okay with you? All right, all the information is on there. We'll be looking forward to seeing you soon. And good job, man. That isn't hard. And you know what? Now I'm going to show you that he's absolutely right. Clint, go watch Revenge of the Creature. Clint Eastwood. All right. On behalf of Scare Los Angeles, thank you very much for having us today. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you to Chris Williams, our art director, production designer. Thank you to Slash and Stacy. Um, we're going to do a little bit of press, and then we'll be out.